Hello and welcome to the Oxford Matt live stream on today's episode, Algebra. Um, <laughs> shout out to people in chat quickly. Um, before we went live, I've been uh, chatting to some anonymous people, but also hi to Oscar, Erb, and Jamie, who I've seen been hanging out in chat. Uh, somebody's already told me that they recognise the problem from the thumbnail or it's similar to another problem they've seen. A lot of maths is about um, realising that a problem you've seen is a bit like a problem you've seen before and uh, we're going to do a little bit of that today um, by trying to recognise things and, and rearrange them. So, hi people who are watching this live. Um, how are you doing? You all right? Uh, I hope I'm live. Uh, you're my only way of knowing whether this is you know, actually happening or not. <laughs> Is this all just a dream? Um, on the screen, while we're welcoming people into uh, chat, um, getting this live stream started, on the screen you might like to read um, the section of the math syllabus that we're looking at today. Um, we've got just a couple of sentences there about algebra. It's that last element that uh, sometimes worries people about probability. Um, ah, people in chat are telling me that I'm live, so that's good. But we're going to talk about probability. Um, hi to you, Miles and Anonymous and Daniel. Um, which exam board is the map based off? Ah, interesting question. Um, the uh, exam boards in the UK are, I think, unified for this sort of material for UK-based A-levels. Um, the the A-level maths curriculum has been standardised, I think. Um, so we think this is standard across the UK. Um, outside the UK could be anything. Um, so. Uh, the reason we published the syllabus and we're going through it week by week is so that you can see topics that you might not have seen yet or you might be about to see. Um, bear in mind there's still time between now and October, so if you're taking them out this year there's still time to learn some things. Um, okay, if you're watching this in the future in October then there's still time between now and later in October. Um, Yes, good. Okay. Hi, Johnny and Ackle. And, oh, yeah, brilliant. Okay, good. Right, there are people here. <laughs> and some maths on the screen. Let's find out how that day was. Um, chat's no longer on the screen. I wanted to make more space for maths, um, but maybe that's a shame. I don't know. I, don't know. Um, I do like having all of this like real estate for putting equations on. Um, uh, people are currently voting on how their day was today. It's important to me to know how you're feeling. Um, if you're watching the replay, then... I guess, sorry, I'll start talking about maths in a minute, I promise. Um, people are voting on the average at the moment, it's 4.1, um, with at least one vote currently for one star with the lowest option in this particular poll, um, which is pretty bad. Um, I don't know if they want to let us know anonymously what's up, what's, 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 the, what's, what's happened. Um, and hopefully doing some maths, especially you know, bashing out some solutions to equations, hopefully that'll be... Uh, a helpful thing to do. Uh, I always say that at the start and it never quite sounds like I believe it but this time I think we all need a bit of routine solving equations in our lives sometimes. Right, the average has settled down to about four stars on how your day was which is pretty good with a, a joint win there for four and five stars. It's lovely unimodal distribution. I should probably analyse these. I should probably collect these together and do some stats or something. Um, can I show you the poll? I think I can show you the poll. It's still a bit risky. Oh no, I can't. <laughs> right, cool. Bear in mind, chat's having an okay day, but not everyone. So let me know. Anonymous person says hi. Hi, anonymous person. Good. Okay, um, let's talk then about some maths. Um, I tried to get ahead with the problem sheets. Um, I didn't manage that. So this one was posted yesterday. Um, my plan, and I'm saying this on uh, camera, so it's peer pressure on myself. Um, my plan is to try and get ahead with the problem sheets a bit more um, so that if you want to get ahead too and if you want to try things before the live stream, you can have a go at that as well. Hi Elsa. Um, right, okay. Uh, but I haven't done that yet. <laughs> so if you're seeing this for the first time, we're going to play along play along at home. Uh, if you've managed to have a look at it earlier today, then you'll know there's some revision questions coming up. Um, just like last week, um, when we get to the revision questions, there are too many to do live, there are 14 of them, um, and I'd like to pick out you know, um, the ones that are most important. Um, if you'd like a copy of this so that you can scroll down or find out what that bit behind my head is, um, you can get a copy from the Matt Live website. Uh, there's a link to the worksheet in the YouTube description, or if you're on Slido, um, you can get to the Matt Live homepage from a link in Slido. Right, cool. Um, hi again. Hi also to Ben and Elena. Right, okay. Let's actually talk about maths, he says, again. Um, <laughs> here we go then. So at the top there, 
Um, we've got simple simultaneous equations in one or two variables. Simultaneous meaning you've got more than one equation at once and you've got to solve both of them. Um, solution of simple inequalities. There's some tricks with inequalities um, that we'll cover in a, in a second. Um, but only simple inequalities here. We're not expecting you to know the sort of integral, um, know the sort of inequality technology that um, some of you might have heard of. Uh, if you were watching Oxford Online Maths Club last term, um, you'll have seen us talk about some other inequalities like um, the AMGM inequality and Jensen's inequality. This is not what we're talking about here. Um, here we're interested in the, the very sort of basic logic about how inequalities work. Um, introductory, I suppose, is the word. Uh, the binomial theorem there, which split over two lines in my my document, sorry about that. Uh, the binomial theorem with a positive whole exponent, that means you can multiply out um, something to the power of n, where n is a positive whole number, um, and combinations of binomial probabilities um, really just means the sort of basic counting problems, um, where if you don't like probability theory, uh, you could do this sort of counting argument. And in the revision notes, I've tried to explain everything, both in terms of probability and in terms of counting, to reassure people who don't like probability that you have this option of counting possibilities. Um, uh, quite someone asked in chat about formatting questions, which I can get distracted about quite easily. Um, my question sheet is formatted in LaTeX. Um, they, claim, they claim that A-level maths questions aren't formatted. And they, they claim that they know this because of the font. Um, it's actually possible to change the font in LaTeX, so that's that's not that's not an obvious not obvious inference to draw. Um, in particular step uses a slightly different font as well. I don't know if you've noticed, but the, the letters are different. This is something that you know you can tell. It's me going off on a nerdy tangent that I should try and avoid. Instead, let's revise about solving equations together. Someone asked before we started this. Uh, show is this going to be fun maths or is this like just revision and it's kind of trying to be both right <laughs> it's fun maths provided i get distracted hi to some more enormous people who are joining and um, maybe they've realized that i just talk rubbish for the first five minutes um i'm going to try and get that, cut that down to to be more on the spot <laughs> in the future we'll see ah uh, the person told me links me to a bmo question links to 2009 bmo 2009 bmo question 2009 was the last time I did being like um, that's probably a question I've done then anyway right good here we go um, I've got an example of some solving equations at the top there um, if this is your first time seeing two simultaneous equations like those ones at the top of the screen um, solving both of them at once there's two variables x and y and we've got to find values for x and y at the same time and um, if it's your very first time seeing that um, then this is probably not the best way to learn it um, but it's actually pretty similar to the stuff that you do when you've got algebra in one variable and um, you know, plugging equations into each other to use both facts at the same time. Um, the rest of this live stream is probably going to be a bit too weird if that's the first time you've seen that, but hey, uh, nice to have you along for the ride as well. Um, I've got some advice about inequalities. Um, in particular, I'm always worried about minus signs with inequalities. Um, there's this sort of trap where you multiply both sides by a negative number, uh, and that, that's sort of allowed, but you have to remember that it flips the sign of the inequality. Uh, like how one is less than three, uh, but minus one isn't less than minus three. If you multiply both sides by minus one, you have to, you have to remember to flip it. Um, that's a technicality that it's just easy to get caught out. Uh, especially if you started with negative numbers and you want to just cross out the minus signs, then to remember to do the flip as well, because you're not just crossing out minus signs, you're flipping flipping the inequality. You can think of it as adding to both sides. Let's not go there. Okay, <laughs> um, and a big bullet point there about the warning about squaring. Squaring both sides is a bit like multiplying um, and that can cause absolute chaos. Um, I have a little diagram for this that isn't in the notes that maybe I'll show you now. Um, uh, somebody says username 404 not found. Um, they are uh, joining today. So, hello, I see you. Um, let me draw you draw a picture for that, uh, what do I want to do, this squaring one. Um, I think it's a picture I've drawn before, ah oh, no, it's a picture we're going to draw in a minute for a revision revision question, but um, let's, let's do it now anyway. Um, so this squaring issue, um, the issue is, um, let's say I've got a graph going, um, this is x, this is y, um, uh, I draw in like y equals 2x. Um, 
that's okay, that's an increasing function. Um, so if I take a larger value of x, I get a larger value of y out. Um, bear with me. Um, um, here's the function y equals minus x. Um, that's a decreasing function, which means that if I put a larger value of x in, I get a smaller value of y out. Um, it, it's different, but it's still predictable. You put a larger value of x in, and you always get a, a more negative value of y out. Um, right, uh, but this is other case. If I think about the function x y equals x squared, going through the origin, there we go. Um, then that's not an increasing function or a decreasing function. It kind of increases in one place and decreases in another place. Um, so if I put in a larger value of x, then I might get something that's bigger for my value of y, or I might get something that's the same size or smaller. Um, those are all possible, um, because I might increase x from here to over here, my value gets bigger, or I might increase x from here to here and it stays the same, or I might increase x from here just to here and it gets smaller. So there's kind of all possibilities. I mean, it's to do with the, the way you're sort of applying a function to each side of the inequality. Um, good. Ah, right. Somebody has posted a, uh, oh my goodness, someone has posted a BMO problem in chat. Let's not get distracted. Hey, those are my equations. Oh, sort of, but with numbers. Oh, yeah. Okay, this is just like a BMO question with pirates in. Um, if you're interested in a BMO question about pirates that's a bit like the thumbnail, um, then apparently the reference you need is BMO1, which is a... UK Maths Competition 2009, question 6, and it's got pirates in, so well worth looking at. Um, I knew when I put equations in the thumbnail that I was making one of those videos, like the ones I've seen on YouTube, where people have got like a tricky maths problem, they put it in the thumbnail and then you click on it to find the solution and you watch their 10 minute video. Um, I've sort of done that, except it's a live stream and it's two hours long. Um, so, I, you know, I'm not great at YouTube. I don't, don't totally get it. Right, uh, <laughs> let's, let's cut back over here. Um, yeah, think about number lines. Yeah, that's an alternative. And sketching graphs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sketching graphs is usually a good trick. Um, depends. Depends a bit, but I, I, I like drawing graphs. Right, okay. Inequalities. Be careful. Not so careful that you never do anything with an inequality, but be a bit careful when you're operating on inequalities. Um, I've written out the binomial theorem there. Uh, underneath this big equation, um, I think it looks more scary than it is. Um, in particular, it, it tells you how to multiply out, uh, if you've got the same bracket, lots of times, um, and two terms inside the bracket, uh, an x and a y. Um, the kind of obvious thing is that if you want to square x plus y, you don't just get x squared and y squared, you get this cross term 2xy in the middle. Um, and the higher the power, the worse it is, right? So if you want to do x plus y to the power of 10, um, you get x to the 10, and at the other end of the spectrum, you get y to the 10, and then you get all sorts of cross terms in between. Um, and the binomial theorem is, a, is an expression for what those are. Um, in terms of these things called the binomial coefficients, uh, which have some nice factorial expression, there's something to do with choosing. Um, there's picking and choosing in there as well. Ah, question in chat about whether this is useful for the Tamua. Um, is this stream useful for the Tamua? Um, I hope so. Um, it'd be quite hard for it to not be useful for the Tamua. Um, it's not specifically following the Tamua syllabus, but the Tamua syllabus is pretty similar to the math syllabus. And besides, thinking about other sorts of maths is probably handy. Uh, somebody in chat has asked about uh, the trinomial theorem, and our chat moderator today, he's an Oxford student, Shao, has replied that there's a multinomial theorem. There is a, a way of expanding this into a more complicated way uh, for more terms inside. Uh, and Jay wants to know if Matt's ever inspired by step. Um, and I think generally, I'd never copy a step question from that question, um, but sort of mutual respect there. Um, do people know about the link between the binomial theorem and choosing? Can I, can I do that now? Uh, if it's obvious for you, then um, if it's obvious for you, then I, I don't want to waste your time. But um, there's a reason why these are the um, co these coefficients are to do with choices. Um, yeah. So there's, there's also something called Pascal's triangle, which you might have seen, which is also about choices. And Oscar's mentioned it in chat. Um, uh, somebody asks if I recommend getting a one-to-one -one tutor for map prep, and 
the main reason I'm doing this is because I think that this is supposed to be sufficient preparation, right? I wouldn't bother. If everyone had to get a one-to-one -one tutor, then I would just get you to do that and save myself the live streams. Lewis Hamiltonian is my pick for favourite username in chat right now. Um, and they watched the stream last year. Uh, and they've given some advice about the Timur that it, apparently I'm helpful for that. Oh, give it. That's such a good oh. So last year we had a lot of F1 names and we had a lot of... Anyway, never mind. Good stuff. <laughs> um, what am I doing? Binomial. Am I talking about choices? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, well, the way to choose the numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so one person in chat said it, but so I'll, say it. I'll say it here anyway. Um, but I won't spend too much time on it. Let's scroll so that that's looking at the binomial theorem. Um, these choices here come from the idea that if I want to make a term that looks like x to the 4, y to the 7 out of this bracket where I've got x plus y 11 times, if I want to make a term that looks like x to the 4, y to the 7, then I make that by as I'm multiplying out, a sort of Frankenstein version of first, outside, inside, last, right? First, outside, inside, last is this method of remembering for two brackets, how you multiply out two brackets like this, first, outside, inside, last. And that goes through all the combinations of things from the first bracket and things from the last bracket. So it's a mnemonic for just two brackets. Um, the kind of Frankenstein version of that is look at all of the possible choices for how you're going to multiply out this. Um, so in e what you get when you multiply it out is every choice for either taking the x or the y multiplied together um, and then add together the similar terms. Um, so sometimes you get x, y, y, x, y, x or something and sometimes you get those with the y's in different places um, but you can simplify them by bringing together the x's and the y's. Um, I've said that really weirdly. Um, what I mean is that the coefficient out here is 11 choose 4, um, that what I want is to choose exactly 4 of the brackets and pick the x from those ones. Um, and if I do that, pick this x, this one, this one and this one say, um, then I'll get a term that looks like x to the 4, y to the 7. Um, and there are lots of ways to do that because there are lots of brackets I could pick where I take the x to the 4. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Yeah. Um, questions in chat catching up um, yeah okay so there's this relationship to get rid of this there's some relationship between choosing and multiplying out brackets uh, because multiplying out, multiplying out brackets is kind of all about making choices uh, question in chat uh, booking for the open day um, not for the maths talks the maths talks we just get as many people in the room as we can um, and we repeat the maths talks quite a lot in the maths department um, other things going on across Oxford you might need to book uh, please look at college websites and the overall timetable plan um, and ideas about how to use these theorems is what we're going to spend a lot of this live stream doing. Um, I'm going through the revision at the moment because maybe you know this already, um, maybe you don't, um, but what I want to spend more of my time on is helping you use these things in slightly unfamiliar situations. Um, there is also a version of the binomial theorem, uh, number nine in chat has told us that there's a version where um, it, you can do this version where n isn't a positive whole number, um, but math syllabus, just positive whole numbers. There's a version with complex numbers, but we're not doing complex numbers today. Um, and Statgal in chat wants to know about the trinomial theorem. I, I sort of think, rather than telling you about the trinomial theorem, I think you can invent the trinomial theorem. Um, the trinomial theorem would be if you had x plus y plus z to the power of n, three things inside the bracket, tri instead of two, by, the trinomial theorem would be what happens when you multiply out x plus y plus z to the power of n. But you can just do that, right? You can do it for n equals 1 and n equals 2 and maybe n equals 3. And by that point, you're getting bored. And then you can think about choices. Um, OK. Yeah, and Akul wants to know, why does Pascal's triangle? What's Pascal's triangle got to do with choices? Um, that's a story for another time, I think. Um, yes. OK. Uh, there's some stuff about cho choices on my syllabus over here. Um, uh, so in the revision notes, I've put in about choosing um, and how the uh, factorials relate to the choices. So there's this expression that uses factorials. Um, there's I've put quite a quite a lengthy discussion of why that is. 
Um, I'm not expecting you to like regurgitate this. I think it's important that you see something like this in your life when you're learning it. Um, I worry a tiny bit that if your teacher's in a hurry, they just tell you that the number of ways to choose is n factorial divided by r factorial, n minus r factorial, and don't tell you why. Um, so I couldn't help myself back from putting this big paragraph about why it's true. Mathematicians, eh? Love explaining why things are true. Um, uh, I think I've also got, yeah, if the order matters, um, then it's not too hard to ad adapt the, the reasoning from that big paragraph about the choices. Um, so that's something like that. Um, final points then, uh, binomial probabilities. Um, we're often interested in uh, something that happens a particular number of times um, and whether we have success. Um, that idea is about choosing like how many successes do you have. Um, uh, we might be interested in like uh, you have 11 coins you flip and you want four of them to be heads. Well, there are quite a few ways that could happen depending on which four coins come up heads. Uh, and I hope you can see that that's related to the choosing from brackets. Um, this idea about choosing from brackets is pretty good. Um, right, uh, yeah, Pascal's Triangle was basically in every episode of Maths Club two terms ago. I talked about Pascal's Triangle way too much. Um, if you're interested in Pascal's Triangle, the Oxford Online Maths Club has some episodes for it. Find it on the Maths on this YouTube channel. There's no formula booklet for the maths. Um, and yes, it's true, uh, the test is being delivered by TCS. Um, we're going to announce what that means in terms of delivery um, later in the summer. Um, for now, let's just focus on the maths. Um, the maths is the same. The maths is what's important. Um, and someone else in chat wants to do the dodecanomal theorem, which I think is 12 things inside a bracket, if, if my Greek prefixes are up to date. Uh, life worries of mathematician do sound a bit mundane. I can't remember what I said, Jay, but apparently mundane. <laughs> good, good, good. Um, oh no, that's me worrying about what your teachers have explained, right? Oh, that's not mundane, that's you missing out on a good explanation. Um, so these binomial probabilities here are, you can think about them as probabilities, where you're sort of dividing by the total number. Or you can think about counting and dividing. Um, yeah, okay. Um, any questions about revision stuff? I can see people putting a lot of questions in chat. Um, mostly about MAT admin. So location for MAT is mostly going to be schools and colleges, especially if you're asking me from the UK. Um, other details going to be announced quite soon. I wanted to have more information ready to go before we started the Matt live stream, but I'm not delaying the Matt live stream. Um, and applications to register for the Matt are going to open in about September. But even that is an example of something that I should be telling you in a couple of weeks when the university put it, puts it out. Go for probabilities again, which is 404. Yeah, let's forget that. Okay, other requests? I might just be teaching probabilities. Um, uh, Ryan wants to know about choosing between mat and step. Uh, that sort of goes with which universities you're applying to. Um, some universities in the UK use mat, some of them use uh, step. Um, I work at Oxford, we're, we're a university that uses mat. Um, so that's the one that I'm doing a live stream about. Um, okay. Um, so probabilities quickly. Um, let's say, so I have, oh, no thank you, there we go. Um, there we go. Uh, have 11 coins, uh, and I flip them, uh, probability uh, of exactly four heads. Um, well, okay, there are lots of things that could happen. You can draw a terrible sort of probability tree for either the first one comes up heads or it doesn't, and then the second one either comes heads or tails, and that one doesn't, and then pick out from all of this Probability tree. In fact, imagine doing this probability tree. It's got 2,000 final node bits on, and it just goes, oh, probability tree for my 11 events that are happening. And then, oh my goodness, in some of these cases, um, in some of these cases, you do get four heads. Um, how many of them? Uh, well, there are 11 coins. Um, and I want four of them. Pick four of them for the ones that have heads, um, which is some number that we can work out with factorials. Um, uh, how many cases are there altogether? Uh, 
well, after 11 flips, I think I just said this, there are um, two to the power of 11 things that can happen as I toss these 11 coins. Um, so probability uh, is the number of ones that work. 11 choose 4 divided by 2 to the 11, the number of things that can happen. Um, things get a little bit more complicated if the coin is biased, um, which is why I've got P's and Q's in there, if it's not a fair coin, um, because then uh, you can imagine along this probability tree um, the things are sort of biased in each direction. So, that, But um, the probability of getting heads, 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 and then seven tails is something. P to the 4, Q to the 7 or something, um, and that just affects each term. They're going to be added together, and there are still 11 G's 4 off these terms. Okay. Is it possible to do both math and step? Yes. Um, and there are completely, times, di completely different times of the year, so uh, not, even, not even that uh, awful. Um, okay. Uh, other universities that require math? Uh, Imperial and Warwick um, will... If you're applying to particular courses at Imperial or Warwick, then you're eligible to take the mat. Um, other universities will look at your mat score if they can get it. There we go. I think I might have just taught probability to just one person, but that's okay. That's kind of the remit. Um, you're welcome. Um, put in the calculator. Ah, there's no calculators for mat. Uh, or just memorize all of them. Right, okay, some joke advice in chat, which I shouldn't have read out. Um, let's look at revision questions. Um, I've got about 14 of these, uh, which is too many to do in the live stream. I want to spend maybe half an hour picking out different ones from here. Um, you might ask, why don't you just write fewer questions so that we can do all of them? And, you know, again, <laughs> I have these questions, right? I don't want to not do them. Um, oh, and good question in chat, actually, while we're thinking about this. If you want a particular question, shout in chat, let me know. Um, I've got some favourites. If nobody says anything, I'll just go for my favourites. Um, uh, we probably should do the one in the thumbnail. Um, <laughs> there's requests for three and eight and nine. Oh, let's write these down. Uh, and six. Um, while that's happening, uh, good question in chat about 11 choose four. Um, Matt is a non-calculated test. Actually working out 11 choose four is probably too much work. <laughs> My best advice, if you have to work out 11 choose 4, is to try and simplify it first before... Oh, that's awful! Yeah, try and simplify it, try and cancel things first before doing any multiplication. So a terrible method for these choose things is to actually work out all three factorials and then do some division. Um, usually you can cancel some factors of 2 or 3 on the top and bottom. So for 11 choose 4 in particular, um, I know the top's going to be 11, 10, 9, 8, and then that, the rest will cancel with the 7 factorial. So I'm not going to write out the rest. It will cancel with the 7 factorial. 11, 10, 9, 8 divided by 4, 3, 2, 1. So I can use the 4 to cancel a bit with the 8. I can use the 3 to cancel a bit with the 9. The 2 cancels a bit with the 8 again, so that's not there. Any. Oh, gosh. And then, <laughs> and then multiply and divide. That's how I would do it. I would not do it. And I would also not like to set it. Uh, questions with cards. would like to add question 11. Uh, Dash uh, over here has an offer, and I pronounced your name terribly, Dash. Um, hi, uh, it's nice to see people coming back. Limits Hamiltonian as well. Um, something that's very gratifying is uh, when I'm teaching people in first year, and they know no stuff because <laughs> no stuff because of this. <laughs> um, good, and request of five as well. So uh, the uh, this looks like lottery numbers. Um, the lottery numbers that I've got for what we would like to talk about are 3, 5, 6, 8, 9, and 11. Uh, very quickly, putting those at the top of the screen then, um, people have requested number 3, which is my favourite, and in the thumbnail, uh, number 5 for some sort of binomial practice, um, 6 for the sum of the coefficients, that question is new for this year, um, 8 because it's weird um, and about squaring, uh, 9 or 10, no coins, but then 11 for some card stuff. And oh, should I admit this? Okay, let's admit this. Um, uh, questions 12, 13, and 14 uh, are gener generated by ChatGPT, um, but then edited quite a bit. Um, so ugh, nobody voted for the ChatGPT questions. Uh, okay, oh no, there's a vote, last minute vote for 10 in here. Coin flipping. Okay, that's probably enough for half an hour. I think, I think we're, we can put more in chat if you want more in chat, but we might not get onto them. People in the chat are now trying to work out 11 choose 4. It, it, 
This is what we're missing by not having chat on screen, right? You could be watching the calculation of 11 choose 4 live. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, let's do 3 first, which is up here. And if I put the screen there, then it looks good. Right. If you clicked on this because of the thumbnail, I'm really sorry for the first half an hour. Um, let's go. Um, okay. The first, first thing to do when you see equations like this is perhaps to stop and think, uh, can you see any obvious solutions? Um, um, any obvious solutions that just, just work for x and y? Um, you've got loads of techniques um, about substituting equations into each other and about solving quadratics and back substituting. Uh, you've got loads of techniques um, and we're going to do them. But first, it's usually a good idea to, to write stuff in. Uh, the mat questions, let's be clear. Okay, right now people are getting worried. Uh, the mat questions are not written by ChatGPT. <laughs> I, I trusted ChatGPT to write some choosy questions about choosing things. Um, I was interested to see what it would do. It tended to pick up quite large numbers. Anyway, uh, there are some suggestions in chat. Um, and 11 choose 4 has turned out to be 330. Just a number I've seen before. Where have I seen that? Yeah, everywhere. Um, and there are some suggestions of the answer in here. Uh, so chat has spotted an uh, obvious solution um, that x equals 1, y equals 1 works. Um, say the line, Bart. Why does it work? Because 1 plus 1 is 2. Welcome to the Oxford Matt live stream. Uh, and also 1 plus 1 is, is 2. Uh, so there's a solution that works, which feels stupid. Um, but uh, there you go. Um, okay, uh, let's try and do some, some solutions here. Uh, my plan when I see ones like this, quadratic term and a linear term, is to try and rearrange it for the linear term uh, to get this variable on its own. And this x, if I try and rearrange this one for x, I think some square roots and stuff, if I try and re rearrange it for y, then that's not so bad. Um, my plan, you see, is to put this in here. Yeah, okay. Andrew's got a different technique that I want to talk about in a second. Um, my plan is to put this in, square that, and I'll get 2. Um, now I've got some equation that's just in x, so I actually feel much better about this. Okay, it's a bit of a horrible equation. I'm going to have to multiply this out. Uh, I suppose I'm multiplying this out with the binomial theorem, but also just by knowing how to multiply out the squares, right? Much harder to do those whilst also talking. Um, I think I've got it though. Um, so I've got a polynomial to solve here. Uh, this one looks a bit hard. Um, hmm, okay. Um, so it looks a little bit hard to solve unless you remember that x equals 1 works. And it should still work. Um, uh, it should still work. It should be a root of this um, polynomial. And we talked about roots of polynomials last week. Um, here, 1 take away 4 plus 1 plus 2 is 0. Not a new catchphrase. So yeah, I'll try and do some long division with, or short division, uh, if you like, with x minus 1. Um, now my experience last year suggests that I can do this kind of division maybe faster than some people. I don't think I'm particularly quick, is it? Um, but I remember last year people got a bit uh, surprised that I was doing it wrong. Um, <laughs> so write down my x cubed. I have to concentrate as well. Write down my x cubed, uh, and that gives me the x to the 4 at the front. Uh, but then minus x cubed. I don't want any x cubed, so I'll put in an x plus x squared here. That will give me an x cubed. Um, but it will also give me minus x squared, which I don't want, so I should subtract 3x. That gives me a plus 3x as well, though. I don't want plus 3x, I want plus x. So I should subtract 2, because the minus 2 will give me minus 2x. Um, then I stop. Phew, okay. Division. If I'm paying attention to what I'm doing, then I get this this out as well. Um, and then I'm kind of almost stuck again. Um, except maybe I can spot another solution. Have I done it right? Have I done it wrong? I think I've done it wrong. <laughs> so that's fun. Oh no, chat, help me out. My four becomes two. No, panic, panic, panic. Don't panic. Was one actually a solution? Yes, of course it was a solution. 
What am I doing? Why am I doing this wrong? I've, I've gone off piste from what I was planning to do, and now I'm panicking. 8 and 4 is 12. Take away 6, take away 2. 2 is not a solution anymore. 2 is probably supposed to be a solution. No, 2 is not a solution. Okay, at this stage, I'm trying to look for other routes of that thing down there. I've checked 2, 2 doesn't work. I've checked 1, 1 doesn't work. I've checked 0, 0 doesn't work. Minus 1, minus 2, hmm, something like this. Is it right so far? Oh yeah, okay. Uh, minus 3x squared. Uh, hmm, no, I think it is this. Minus eight. I think I'm now right. <laughs> we had the panic moment, but I think I'm now right. Um, after checking some more routes, um, x plus two is a factor of this because minus two is a root. Um, that's easier to spot, and this is weird. That's easier to spot back in this line. Um, this bit's a multiple of x plus two, uh, and so's this bit because of difference of two squares. Um, so what I did there was I looked at my solutions document, um, which you can also do as well because the solutions are on the MatLive website. Um, I put them up at the same time as the questions. Um, if you go to the MatLive website, uh, there's a table with a link to this YouTube stream, uh, circular reference, um, and also a link to the solutions doc. Look to that and the solution I did yesterday. Oh my goodness. Way better. Do you ever look at something you did in the past and think, what on earth is going on here? Who wrote this? What were they thinking? What were they doing? Ah, that's an advert to go and look at what I wrote yesterday when I did this question much faster. <laughs> cool, right. Okay, um, I've got down to one or minus two um, or some sort of quadratic. The quadratic's got nice solutions. Well, nice-ish, nice-ish solutions. And the quadratic has solutions one plus or minus root five over two. Um, those are solutions for x. I should plug those back into here to find out what y is. Or hmm, maybe use some sort of symmetry ideas that x and y play kind of symmetric roles in these equations. Um, anyway, that's a bit vague. Um, I think minus 2y equals minus 2 works. Um, x equals 1 plus root 5 over 2. y equals 1, it turns out I want 1 minus 5 over, root 5 over 2. Or the other way around vice versa. This is a nice symmetry. X and Y, you can switch them around and you get the same equations, so you get the same answers. Um, and that symmetry is something else I wanted to talk about. So it's kind of method of plug it in and then solve. Substitute, solve, back substitute. Um, it is pretty standard. It's a bit hard here because of the two quadratics. Um, there's a slightly different approach, which I saw Andra in chat mention first, which is to take these two equations and to do some operations to them. To think about taking the difference between them. Uh, if you've got things that are equal, sometimes looking at the difference is interesting. I mean, the difference is zero. Um, but the difference sort of simple, is nice and simple, and it factorizes quite nicely to be this thing, x, x minus 1 equals y, y minus 1. Okay, which is pretty nice. Um, let's just x equals y, or I suppose I should bring that onto the left-hand side. No, what am I doing? <laughs> um, yeah, I factorized that weirdly. Why have I done that? Oh, yeah, 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 sorry, I difference of two squares so up here. That's not too bad at all. Difference of two squares to factorise it. Thank you, Carl Frederick Gauss in chat. Oh, there we go, okay. This is a bit misleading, maybe. It's got true, but not useful. Um, okay, so then either x is equal to y or x plus y is equal to 1. Those are much nicer equations. You can then go and sort of back substitute these and say, aha, if x is equal to y... Oh, I'm off the bottom of the screen. Ah. If x is equal to y, then go back up and you get a nice quadratic to solve. 
um, or if x plus y is equal to 1, um, then oh, I have to go and back substitute for x, I think. I've gone off screen. Sorry. Thanks, chat. It's such a narrow screen now. Um, good. Okay. Um, before I went off screen, I did something sort of daft. But I want to point at it. This stream is not trying to make me look clever. Goodness knows it doesn't make me look clever. Um, but along the way there, I did this step, which wasn't false, um, just didn't help. Maybe it could help me if I was cleverer. Um, I could say, aha, this is a quadratic on the left and the same quadratic with a different variable on the right. That means that x and y have the same value on the quadratic u, u minus 1. Where does the same value happen? Either at the same point or opposite the line of symmetry for the quadratic. If you knew a lot about quadratics, then you can argue like that. Um, but I realised that that was not useful, that I couldn't, you know, I wasn't clever enough to understand quadratics well enough to say that. Um, so I did a U-turn. Um, went back here, looked at it again, and then came down and did some different maths. Um, I have to admit, I learned the ability to U-turn quite late in in my maths education because I was used to just barging through, um, just trying to make stuff work and say something clever about a quadratic if you have to. It's quite late on that I learned to backtrack and have another approach. Um, something similar going on over here. But that was more based on previous experience where this was going quite wrong. Has it actually gone wrong? Am I not clever enough to make progress with this thing over here? Um, or not insightful enough? Or not currently spotting the thing that um, is going on? Um, maybe I should look back again. And if you look back again, aha, x plus 2 and some sort of difference of two squares. Okay, so two examples on screen, very narrow screen, but two examples on screen of points where. I did the first thing I wanted to do. Things got a bit more complicated or messy than they maybe needed to. Um, so doing the U-turn and looking back, and in both cases spotting difference of two squares, it's the right way to go. That wasn't the point that I thought I was going to make when I started this. Um, I thought I was going to make a point about how lovely symmetry is and how nice these equations are. But actually, I've made a point about me not being able to solve things. Hmm. Right. Good. OK. <laughs> Some live streams. <laughs> uh, good, right. Could be worse. I could be trying to play video games on a live stream. That would go even worse. Um, let's talk about five and six. I think we've done that one to death. Um, five and six. Okay, so uh, question five there wants a coefficient of this, um, this expression. Um, and I guess it's tricky because... Uh, it's like the binomial theorem x plus y to the n. Um, n is 4. But x isn't x here, it's 3x. Um, so really what I want to do is like write this 3x in brackets. And write this minus 1 in brackets. And then really squint until 3x looks like first thing and minus 1 looks like second thing. Um, and then when I do the expansion, that'll turn out to be you know, first thing to the power of 4 plus qubit. Multiply it by the other one, 4 choose 1, plus square it, other one squared, 4 choose 2, plus, and so on and so on and so on. And then stop when you get to, stop when you get to 0 and 4. And these kind of go 4 and 0, 3 and 1, 2 and 2, yeah, ascending, descending. Um, anyway, what was the question? I'll find the coefficient of x squared. Uh, that's going to be this one. Um, so the coefficient of x squared is going to have a 3 squared, a minus 1 squared, and a 4 choose 2, um, I would accept that as an answer. Um, it's possible to go and work that out. I think it's 54. Um, cool. And, okay, so there's a kind of binomial thing, um, but again, the kind of warning here is that x might not be presented as x, it might be a 3x or something. Plus and minus signs um, shouldn't worry you too much. Um, it's not the case that there's a, a separate theorem for for this thing, x minus y to the power of n. Um, so the same theorem, just but minus y. Anyway, you would have seen a y. Um, because x take away y is the same thing as x plus minus y. Right, good. OK. Um, was my factorization wrong? Bother. 
It's a personal pride now. No, I'm keeping it. Okay. <laughs> um, good. Which one was that? That was five. Um, six wants the sum of the coefficients. Um, this is a little bit cheeky. Uh, it's a little bit of pattern spotting, I suppose. Um, the sum of the coefficients. So this is x cubed plus, let's see if I can do this like this. 3 cheese 1, uh, 2x squared plus 3 cheese 2. 4x plus 8, uh, 3 choose 3, 2 cubed, um, which is x cubed plus 6x squared plus 24x plus 8. So the sum of the coefficients is, uh, there's a 1 out here, a 6 here, a 24 here, and an 8 here. What have I done wrong? No, I can't multiply 3 by 4. 12. 12. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. It's 27. Um, yeah, remembering that these numbers are 1, 3, 3, 1 seems like a good idea. Uh, and being able to multiply 3 by 4 would be a good idea. Um, people are still telling me that I can't divide polynomials right. So I think I'm just going to move on from my polynomial disaster class um, to my adding disaster class. <laughs> it's a tough day to be me. Could um, there be infinite series? And um, we've got one sort of infinite series on that. Um, in about a month and a half's time, we've got an episode about sequences um, with geometric sequences and uh, geometric series on there. So it's the, the only sort of infinite, um, infinite series that we're going to do. Um, just one. Um, yeah, so if you know Pascal's triangle, uh, Pascal's triangle looks like this. In Pascal's triangle, each number is the sum of the numbers above it. So you can have the pair of numbers here, 3 plus 1 is 4. And then working down, I'll we'll do 1, 1 plus 4 is 5, 4 plus 6 is 10, 10, 5, 1. I'm adding up the things above. Um, this gives you the coefficients. Um, it's not obvious why that, gives, why that gives you the same things as choosing. Um, uh, maybe you think about that as homework. Uh, do I have a UCAS account? Yes, I made one for fun um, to find out what UCAS looks like these days. Um, okay. Or well, maybe is that a question? Do you have to have a UCAS account? You apply through UCAS for UK universities. Um, good. Okay. What was I doing? Oh, yes, uh, the sum of the coefficients. Um, the sum of the coefficients here is 27. And the next part of the question asks us to do x plus 2 to the 300. Now, let's not multiply out the terms. Um, instead, let's notice that what you want when you make the sum of the coefficients, what you want is for all of the x's to go away. Well, actually, it's not totally go away. Don't plug in 0. Um, plugging in 0 will just give you the last, last coefficient over here, um, a constant term. Um, but if you plug in x equals 1, then all of the powers will become 1, and I'll just be left with this sum. So plugging in x equals 1 is a way to get the sum of the coefficients. Um, and that also works, because these expressions are equal, over here. If I just plug in x equals 1, then I get 1 plus 2 to the power of 3, and that's 27. So a quick way to work out the sum of the coefficients of a polynomial or something you know to be a polynomial, um, is to plug in the number 1. Uh, so the sum of the coefficients of x plus 2 to the 300 uh, is just 3 to the power of 300. Um, so it's quite a good fact. Um, if you dig into it, this is sort of a fact about the binomial coefficients. Um, in Pascal's triangle, for example, I've just got them on the screen in a triangle shape over here, so let's talk about Pascal's triangle. If you add up the rows, um, you get 2, you get 4, you get 8, you get 16, and you get 32, um, which sounds like magic until you remember that the binomial coefficients are all about choices, and the total number of choices is something like the total number of um, subsets. Um, okay. Uh, Oh, chat just did something funny. Oh, no, we're good. Um, 
I'm seeing the triangle. Yeah, plugging in x equals one is a very good idea. Um, stat guy in the chat wants to know why zero factorial is one. Um, I suppose good question. Uh, one answer is that if you've got zero objects, there's exactly one way uh, to arrange them, which is to not write anything down. Um, but that's not a very satisfying answer, I think. Um, uh, maybe a better reason is that, um, well, then it makes a lot of our formulas um, consistent so that if I write down 5 choose 4 is 5 factorial over 4 factorial, 1 factorial, that's true. Um, if I want to write down 5 choose 5, choose 5 is 5 factorial over 5 factorial divided by 0 factorial, um, then a sensible reaction would be, damn, you've gone off the bottom of the screen. A sensible reaction would be, um, what's zero factorial? Um, one would work in that expression because because the thing is one. Um, there's one way to choose five objects from uh, five objects. Um, shuffle your five objects. That's just sequence. <laughs> shuffle your five objects. But wait, the shuffling of the five objects didn't matter, so divide. Um, and also, the shuffling of the zero left out objects didn't matter. Um, there's only one way to shuffle your left out, zero left out objects. Um, so just divide by zero. I keep going off screen today. It's really annoying. Uh, let's see if I can fix that uh, with post it notes. Uh, okay. It's because I've got it set up. I've got it set up so that I can have the questions and the answers on screen, but also so that I can switch to this view. And I keep forgetting I'm not on this view. I'm on this one, which cuts off the lower half. Don't worry, chat, I fixed it with post-its. Um, struggle to pay attention? It's because the Matt live stream is hard to pay attention to because we talk about a lot of different things and I keep changing topic uh, due to my attention span. <laughs> you think it's hard to pay attention to watching it? It's also hard to pay attention to... A stream of nonsense coming out of my own mouth. Right, okay, uh, what are we doing? Uh, we have requests. They were up here. The requests were for 3, 5, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11. A stretch of four questions. We've got about eight minutes and then 14 if we've got time as well. Um, let's try and do some of those. I think they're about choosing. Ah, no, squaring as well. Square question. Um, so the question says, given minus 2 is less than a is less than 1, um, what can you say about a squared? Um, and here a diagram is really useful. So if I put a on this axis and I draw a squared, or maybe like y equals a squared or something, um, I just want an excuse to draw a parabola. Let me draw my parabola. Um, and minus 2 is over here, 1 is over here, and then a is somewhere in this region. Okay. Um, it's not here at minus two, and it's not at minus one. Um, then the question is, where is a squared? What's the what's the range for a squared? Um, what can you tell me? Um, and I suppose if we look at the relevant bit of the parabola or this quadratic graph, um, it's not here. It's not here. It's somewhere in between. And this curve comes down, and then it goes back up again. Um, so it's not as big as minus 2 squared is 4, um, but it could be something a bit lower, and it could be 0. Um, it could be 0 because a could be 0. But not minus 2. So I suppose I can say that a squared is bigger than or equal to 0, and it's less than 4. I don't think I can say any more than that. Um, it could be anything in that range, uh, or it could be zero. Mm. It's maybe a little bit weird that the interval to start off with here um, just had less than signs, not less than or equal to signs. But the a squared integral, uh, the a squared interval, has this uh, less than or equal to sign in. Like the, it's not just the numbers that you have to think about; it's the the nature of the signs. Um, this is pretty tough. Um, different ways to think about uh, this. So without using graphs, yeah, without using graphs, and someone also not a joke about complex numbers. Um, without using graphs, I'd do two cases. I'd say either um, minus two is less than a is less than zero, or a is between zero and one. In each of these cases, um, on the right hand side there, it's all positive numbers um, or zero. So squaring is fine. 
Um, in this case, everything's negative. So when I multiply, I'm, I'm always multiplying my negative numbers. So that's going to flip the inequality like this. Um, so then I end up with a is between, if I rewrite that one in a more sensible, more sensible order, um, a is between 0 and 4, or a, oh, sorry, a squared. A squared is between 0 and 1, but inclusive on the 0 over there. Um, okay, so putting those together, uh, either a is between 0 and 4, or it's between 0 and 1, or it could be 0. Okay, well, that means it's either 0 or it's between 0 and 4. That interval is kind of including that one, without any uh, diagrams. Um, yeah, the less than 1 sort of doesn't matter. Like, uh, if this was a 0.5 or something, the answer's the same. Um, if it's a 3, the answer's different. Um, if I make it all the way out here, 3, then the sort of pink bit extends all the way up to 9, um, and then it matters again. So it sort of doesn't matter at the moment, but it could matter. Um, it's a little bit like taking, a, taking the number line and folding it, uh, folding it over. So it's the bit that sticks out the most that matters. Um, and the, at the turning point, there's something interesting going on. Why did I flip some signs? Uh, so here I flipped some signs because I was multiplying by negative numbers, which is like a big warning times a negative. That looks like I've put cross negative, but hey, I'm multiplying by negative things. Big warning sign. It flipped the inequalities, and then I flipped them here because I was writing the stuff in the other direction. <laughs> maybe that's maybe that's misleading. Uh, I've just written it right to left instead of left to right. Because having great R signs makes me feel uncomfortable. I don't know. Um, if we have a is less than four and a is less than one, wouldn't we only have a is less than one? Ah, this is an or. Um, it's not an and. Um, it's or. Um, either we're on the left of the graph or on the right of the graph. Um, either or. Um, so either a squared is less than four or a squared is less than one. It means well, the second bit's kind of redundant, right? He told me that a squared is less than four. Uh, or maybe a squared is really small. Uh, maybe it's small or very small. Maybe um, the t-shirts come in two sizes. You can have small, or you can have you have smaller. You can have a small one or a yeah. Never mind. <laughs> Forget the t-shirts. <laughs> um, right. Okay. What are we doing? Oh my goodness. Uh, we're running over time, I think, because I do want to talk about some choosy binomial stuff. Because in the past, there's been ones that wants to talk about. Um, for the inequalities question 9, I think I'm skipping it. Um, we can say, in the first case we can say almost nothing. Um, you can come up with examples where those products are one's bigger than the other, one's smaller than the other. In the second case where you're told that things are positive, life is a bit better. Uh, you can say something. Um, uh, but, you know, I guess yeah, everything's positive in the second case, so you're okay. Uh, yeah, so splitting it on zero so that you can think about the signs, the different cases separately and track your cases separately. Um, I did that because somebody wanted a, a version without any graphs, um, and that was the first thing I thought of. Uh, there's, like, there's a higher probability that if it's an A is between 0 and 1 if I tell you it twice. Okay. Mm. <laughs> We're not on a probability set question yet. Uh, except now we are, because now uh, 10 coins. Um, and that 10 thing is about flipping 5 coins and getting 3 heads. Um, that's the sort of standard... Uh, calculation where the the thing you write down is five choose three. Uh, that's the number of ways that you just choose which three coins are going to do the thing. Um, are they fair coins? Um, yeah, sure. Well, let's write down uh, those three. I want them to come up heads. Um, so so far, this maybe maybe this makes sense. Is choose which three coins are going to come up heads. There are loads of ways that could happen. Your your thing looks pretty likely to happen because there are loads of ways you can choose three things from five. Um, and then you need each one to come up heads. You need to get lucky on each one of those. Um, you also need to get lucky on the other ones. They need to be not heads, because I would like exactly three heads total. So it's, it's this. Um, for a fair coin, these things are all one half, so you just write one over two to the power of five quite often. Um, but this is kind of what's going on, that it's five choose three, the number of ways to choose these coins. Uh, they do what you want, and the other ones also do what you want. You know. So it's kind of... Each individual thing is quite unlikely because of the one half to the power of five, uh, but you've got loads of them. You've got a lot of dogs in the race. Uh, good, okay, 11. Uh, six cards, and we're asked for something slightly weird, which is the probability that they alternate between odd and even numbers. Um, there are ways to think about this to do with sort of a probability tree, um, where I pull out the first card, and the first card is either odd or even. 
um, and then that affects the probabilities going forwards. Um, so what's the probability that I see odd, even, odd, even, odd? Um, but there's a different way to think about this. So you can draw your probability tree again. Um, it's a bit of a mess drawing the probability tree, I think. Um, there's a different way to think about this, um, where you think instead about the number of ways that can happen. Um, this is the kind of classic uh, counting versus probability. Um, so you can think about this sequence of things happening, or you can think about the possible outcomes. Um, so these six cards, here they are, they're face down at the moment, you can't see them. Um, there are 720 possible shuffles of those six cards. Um, um, how many of them go... Uh, I want alternating, right? So I want even, odd, even, odd, even, odd. Um, and then also I want to know about how many, how many go odd, even, odd, even, odd, even. Um, I kind of want to know both of those things. Um, I reckon... Those numbers might be the same, and then I'm going to add them together. Um, okay, so if they go even odd, even odd, even odd. Um, now you can think about that as a probability tree, that maybe the first one's even, maybe it's not. Maybe the second one's odd, maybe it's not. Um, but instead of that, I think it's complicated because the cards are, are separate, right? Um, once you've drawn, once you've revealed that this one is six, none of the other cards are the card six. Um, so that's a bit tricky. Um, instead, let's think about filling them in. So. If I write out some sequences that go even, odd, even, odd, uh, maybe you can see that uh, what I need is I need the cards 2, 4, and 6 to be in those positions and the cards 1, 3, and 5 to be in those positions. Um, which is a fancy way of saying that I kind of the slots are fixed if I'm going even, odd, even, odd, even, odd. Those three slots are booked for even cards here, here, and here. Um, but I can shuffle which one's which. I don't mind where 2, 4, and 6 are. They don't have to be in order. They can be 6, 4, 2, 2, 4, 6, um, something like that. Um, so I think there are three factorial um, squared, because I can also shuffle the odd cards, I've remembered. The 1, 3, 5. <laughs> Looks like I'm just excited about the number 3, right? Um, but I can shuffle around the odd cards as well. Um, so they could go in order, 1, 3, 5, or they could go 1, 5, 3, or they could go 5, 3, 1. Um, there are some shuffles of those as well. Yep, so 3 times 3 times 2 times 2 times 1 times 1, which is 6 squared, which is 36. Um, and there are also 36 arrangements that do something pretty similar, but absolutely different, where they go odd, even, odd, even, odd, even. Um, 6 because I can shuffle around my even cards, and uh, 6 ways to shuffle around my odd cards, multiply those together. Um, so... 3 factorial, 3 factorial over there as well. Okay, um, that's 36, that's 72 total, so my total is 72 out of the 720 shuffles total, which is 1 in 10. Um, I wanted to go through that rather than doing the probability tree. Um, you might already know how to do the probability tree as well. Um, yeah, so the probability tree, someone's put it in chat. They're an anonymous person, but I'm going to read it out anyway. Um, so the first one doesn't matter. Let's do it now, let's do it now. We're going to get the same number, which is 1 over 10. The first one doesn't matter. It could be even or odd. That hasn't ruined our streak yet. Um, and then for the second card, um, it's going to be the opposite sort of parity, or the opposite sort of evenness or oddness to the first card. Um, there are three cards that three cards that are like that left. We've just seen this one. Um, three cards that are like that. Um, so there are three out of five... Um, probability that we pick one of them now to be the other sort. Uh, so that's my first card. Maybe it was odd, maybe it was even. Doesn't really matter. And my second card. Aha! I drew it. Brilliant! Three out of five. Um, probability that that one works out. And then I, I turn over the third card and it's suspenseful because I know there are two even cards and two odd cards left. I, I want, at this point, one that matches the first card. That's two of them. Um, no matter whether I'm talking about odd cards or even cards. Oh, it comes up. It's perfect. 50-50 there, a bit of a coin flip. Um, now I've got three cards left, and a bit odds are a bit more in my favour, because three cards left, two of them are the sort that I want um, that matches this to the second card, because uh, it's currently behind on the race, I suppose. Uh, so two-thirds of the time, that one wins. Um, and now I'm pretty happy, because I've got two cards left. The 50-50, is this one going to be the one that matches the first and the third cards, or is it going to be one that doesn't match? Um, so 50-50, that works. And then the last one is definitely going to fall into place. By that point, everything's going well so far. So I suppose this is all 6 out of 6. Um, and the number along the top there is how many things 
sort of agree with what I was doing along the way. Um, and I think that simplifies down nicely to be 72 over 720. So it's kind of a series of probabilities of things happening. Um, I forgot to double it. It could be EO, 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 EO. I think I doubled it uh, here. So I said this is 36. This is 36, and I did double it. Okay. Yes. I multiplied. I multiplied in each of my cases. I multiplied um, because those things happen together. In the same event, um, I need these different things to happen. Um, the same sequence of events to make this work. Um, like how over here on the left I'm talking about a sequence of things happening and I need all of them to happen, so I'm multiplying. So I'm multiplying here, but I'm adding my two cases together because they're mutually exclusive. Um, so, <laughs> little probability, if you, want, if you want and, if you want this to happen and that to happen, you multiply them. If you want uh, this to happen or that to happen and they're mutually exclusive, then you add them. Um, hmm. Pretty tricky. Oh, they were actually talking to Andrew. Um, yeah, okay. They weren't talking to me at all. But anyway, <laughs> I'm here too. <laughs> right, good. Um, we're running a little bit over time, but I've still got requests, I think, for... Oh, it was just 14, right? It was just 14. Let's have a quick look at 14. Oh, it's one of the chat GPT ones. Um, oh, no, hang on. Did ChatGPT write this and then I modified it to sound a bit like the mat? Yeah, I think that happened. Um, uh, so the final answer is a complete mess and don't bother simplifying your answer. Um, but it's a bit like a lot of biased coin flips. Um, you're guessing on every question. So the probability that you get a given question right um, is one fifth. Uh, the probability that you get a question wrong is sadly four fifths. Um, so the probability you get 10 right you really ace the test, um, is uh, p to the 10, uh, which seems pretty unlikely, but hey. And the probability that you get exactly 9 right, uh, well, which 9 was it? Uh, there are several ways to do that. And kind of obviously there are 10 ways to do that, but let's write it as 10 choose 1. Choose 1 of these 10 that is the one you get, got wrong. If you prefer to think about it as choosing the 9 that you're getting right, then you could write down 10 choose 9. It's the same number. Um, 10 choose 9, uh, and then, okay, so you're telling me you've got all of those ones right, seems unlikely, and you got that other one wrong. Uh, seems more likely to me, but hey, we're going to multiply all those things together. Um, and the probability that you get 8 right, or correct, I suppose I should be saying, is 10 choose 2, 1 over 5 to the 8, 4 over 5 squared. Now, notice how inside each of these, you're having uh, different things happen. These ones are right, these ones are wrong, all in the same kind of event, the same imagine scenario of you taking the test. Um, so I'm multiplying. Um, I haven't written my multiply signs, but hey. Um, but then these are mutually exclusive events, so we're going to add, the, add these numbers together um, to get the final, final answer of, I don't know, goodness knows, whatever adding those numbers together is. I'm not doing it on the screen. Right, good, okay. A um, little bit over time, uh, but I think that's revision. Um, I would like to talk about the math questions. I saw someone in chat said that they'd done the math questions about an hour ago, so there we go. Would I give you easier numbers in math? Yeah, I would not make you calculate this in math. I guess this is revision, but not a math question. Let's look at a math question. Oh, there we go. Here's a math question. Um, uh, and a reasonable response to this math question might be, wait, you said this was the algebra week, and that's clearly a geometry question. Uh, to which, I suppose, a fair point. Um, but hear me out, uh, you have to do a lot of algebra during this math question. Uh, there are bits of it where you'll need to uh, do, some, do some algebra along the way. Um, okay, I'm going to read out the question and try and sort of get on with it a little bit, I think, for time. Um, uh, Miles in chat has got um, first one's fine, second one's lots of algebra. So what well, happened to the algebra live stream? Um, okay, if it's your first time seeing a math question, uh, this is what they look like. They've got multiple parts. Um, there's a diagram there. I'm going to copy a small version of the diagram uh, over onto my whiteboard so that we can keep it. Um, it's the parabola y equals x squared. 
Um, Q is a point on there, and P is the point 0, 1. P is the point 0, 1. Um, we would like to find the equation of the normal. Um, we've got something going up. Um, we've got something going up, coming on here with um, coming up later this summer. We've got a lecture about normals and curves and things. Um, if you haven't seen this, then don't panic. Uh, more stuff coming up later this summer. Uh, let us go over here then and calculate this. Okay. Oh, I can fit all the parts of this question on the screen. That's nice. Um, yeah, just. Okay. And I've got my little diagram. It's a tiny diagram. Let's go. Um, J's off by J, because uh, J doesn't want to see math questions. Um, okay, let's find the normal at Q. Um, to do that, we need to find the gradient of the curve there, and then find the gradient of the normal. It's a little bit of a process. Um, so first, let's write down derivative x is 2x um, at Q. You know, I think Q has the coordinates a comma a squared, which didn't make it onto my diagram, but there we go. Um, so at x equals a, and this is 2a, that's the gradient of the tangent. The normal is at right angles to the tangent. Um, so it has gradient minus 1 over 2a. Um, that's the fact that if lines are at right angles, their gradients multiply to minus 1. Um, yes, OK. Uh, so it is the, uh, equation, the equation of that line then is and I know a formula for this, so I think I'm going to write down quite fast. Um, uh, m, you put the gradient outside here, and then x take away uh, the x coordinate, but don't forget to add on the y coordinate of what you want. Um, I always write my lines down like this, um, force of habit, I suppose. Um, I've got x take away x1, and I've got kind of plus a y1 on the end. It's a little bit wonky, um, but, but there you go. Why is the negative reciprocal thing work? It's good, isn't it? Um, more information in a future live stream about uh, curves and graphs and uh, gradients and normals. Um, it's really good. There's a general version of this fact which I am struggling to not tell you. I really want to tell you this general version of this fact. Um, in general, if you've got two lines where the, the angle between them is known, then you can write down some brilliant relationship between the gradients m1 and m2. There's just some, some lovely formula for that. Um, for a right angle, it simplifies really nicely. Um, and the fact is that m1 and m2 are supposed to be uh, multiplied to give 1. Um, I think you can prove it with Pythagoras because it's a right angle sort of fact. Um, let's put the points at the origin. Oh, no, we're doing a maths. We're doing a maths. Let's go. If you're trying to see the math question, the math question is on the screen. Uh, please check that this line is correct and then try and send it through p. Uh, I'm going to give you a second to do that while I tell this person why the gradient fact is true. Um, sometimes on the live stream I'm just talking to one person. Um, so that person who wanted one-to-one -one tuition, hey. Um, <laughs> so let's put some points on your line. So this one's got gradient m1, and it goes through the point 1 comma m1. And this this one's got gradient m2, and in my picture I would say that's going through the line minus 1 comma minus m2. Um, it, it's m2 times x. Um, I've put minus 1 over here just because I felt like that line was going roughly over there. Um, my plan is to prove that this is a right angle triangle. Um, so I've marked in the right angle already. That was presumptuous of me. I'm trying to prove there's a right angle by checking that it does Pythagoras. Uh, this, now that I've said that out loud, seems like a really stupid plan. Uh, but it's too late now. Let's go. <laughs> um, so Pythagoras on that uh, the distance there, those points don't actually have the same y coordinate. It's a bad diagram. Um, the difference in their x coordinates is 2, uh, and the difference in their y coordinates is m1 plus m2 squared. Um, so that's the square of the distance. Whereas the distance along this side, um, Pythagoras says that the distance there is 1 squared plus m1 squared, and the distance along the other one is 1 squared plus m2 squared. I'm writing out squares, the distance is Pythagoras is, well, sorry, Pythagoras or a square is all about the squares of the sum of the sides. Um, so, um, what have I done wrong? <laughs> Something like this, and then follow through. And it's a right angle if, yeah, okay. 
I'm almost there. I'm not quite there. Telling me my line works. Hmm. Oh, I'm people found the values of a. Oh, why is there minus one of two? I'm on the a squared. Um, going to come back to this in a second. <laughs> so equation of a line over here. Um, you're probably used to lines being written like y equals mx plus c, and um, where m is the gradient and c is the constant. Um, if you like, you can write down y equals this gradient plus a constant, and then work out what c is by sending it through the point a, a squared. So you put an a in here for x and an a squared on the left, and rearrange to get c. Um, I know a slightly faster method, I suppose, where I've done so many lines, I suppose, that I know that if you write it down in this format, it, it kind of always works. Um, this line has got the right gradient, the coefficient of x is right, and the constant has been carefully made out of this bit and that bit, so that when I plug in x equals a, this term goes away, and I'm left with a squared. Hmm. Um, okay. Good. Um, yeah, you can do some tan theta stuff. Ah, oh, two squared is four. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes talking out loud makes makes things better. Um, two squared is four. So these things would be equal. Plus this. Are these things equal? Is that a right angle? Well, um, one plus one is two, um, so I'd need would need needs two plus and the leftover cross term from multiplying out that thing in there is two times m one m two. Um, so I'd need m one m two to be minus one. I need the product of the gradients to be minus one. I don't know why I blanked so much on that. Stick the landing. Do the final conclusion. I think I genuinely thought that one squared plus one squared was two squared in my head. It's been a long day. Um, right, cool. <laughs> Got an equation of a line. Um, does it go through P? Um, there are three solutions. Yeah, Miles and uh, somebody else in chat uh, earlier on. Who was it? Uh, yes. Um, yeah. Uh, have suggested there are two values. So, does it go through um, 0, 1? And the answer is yes, if this thing is true. 2a minus a plus an a squared, um, which, if you rearrange it a lot, says a squared is the a's cancel or minus 1, 1 half. Over 1 half. a is plus or minus the square root of 1 over root 2. It's worth thinking about that. And thinking about uh, what would happen if you uh, well, kind of animated this, so you have this quadratic, um, and you move the point Q around, so you move it, and it gets down to about here somewhere, um, and the normal just goes shoop through point P, and if you bring it around here, it goes through point P, um, and maybe if you imagine that, you realise that there's another case where the normal goes through P. Um, ah, there's another case that we've missed. Um, uh, in between for zero. Um, actually, loads of stuff that I've written on the board is wrong if a equals zero, which doesn't work if a equals zero. Um, uh, the problem is here where I'm dividing by a. Um, the gradient is at zero. The gradient at zero is zero. Um, but here I should be more careful. Um, it's this minus one over two a. All of this stuff, but only if this number exists. Um, otherwise. I've got to think about the case um, a equals zero, especially. Um, because if a equals zero, the point q is at the origin. Um, and then the normal is just this vertical line, x equals zero. Hmm, a little bit different. Yeah. Don't you stop in zero, x equals zero? That's what I did. I stopped in x equals zero. Um, and I'm trying to get one for my value of y. Rearranging it. Good. Yeah, vertical straight line. Um, so there's this other solution, because that does happen to go through p, because it's vertical straight line through the origin. Um, I'll just go through p. So there's this other one where maybe a could be zero. 
Weird. Okay, so three solutions. Where does the minus a come from? Uh, hang on, let me two-step it. Uh, that's my line. Um, does it go through zero, one? Well, to go through zero, one, um, let's put this into a sentence, it does if y is one at the same time that x is zero. So this minus a inside here is sneakily a zero minus a. Now I've plugged in zero for x and one for y. Do you know, explore, is this point p an example of values of x and y that satisfy that equation? The line is made of points that satisfy the equation. Is p one of them? Uh, well, p is 0, 1, so I should plug in x equals 0, y equals 1, and check whether it works. Um, and it kind of doesn't work unless a takes a very particular set of values. Um, git. Okay. Uh, how many marks would you lose for not thinking about 0? Oh, I don't know. Let's not think about marks right now. And evil laughter, I think Rowan also mentioned evil laughter in chat. I think this is an evil trap. Um, I would hope not very many. And I'm not just saying that because I forgot the zero as well just now. Um, I don't think it's that exciting. Well, hmm. This, you see, the rest of the question gets you to think about a equals zero quite a bit. So probably you could find, think, maybe you could uh, have another chance later on to remember about a equals zero. We'll see. Okay. Um, so uh, we're next asked about the distance QP, um, which is the distance between Q and P. Um, that's just Pythagoras. Um, there's really nothing mysterious going on here. Um, uh, we know where Q is. We know where P is. Uh, it was higher up in the question. Let me just point at their diagram again. They told us where Q was. They told us where P was. There's a picture. Down here, we're asked to find that distance. I'm not scared, I can write down the difference in the x coordinates and the difference in the y coordinates, like that. Um, that's QP. Uh, oh, I've actually been asked for QP squared, so don't write down the square root, James. Um, and that's kind of a clue that when we're trying to minimize this thing, it's easier to think about the minimum of uh, QP squared rather than thinking about the minimum of QP. Um, Square root's an increasing function, so that's okay. Um, okay, so we want to make this small. Um, what is it? Uh, uh, simplest answer is perhaps it's a quartic. It's a polynomial of degree four from last week, um, uh, which I can rearrange to look like this. Um, which is maybe not very satisfying. Um, that's actually a quadratic in a squared. Um, if you remember hidden quadratics from before, um, that's a quadratic in disguise. So we could maybe complete the square um, on that expression. If we really wanted to, we could go and complete the square. Um, yeah, let's do it like that. That sounds fun. Um, so if we complete the square on this. Now, future episodes on integration and differentiation next week, I think, um, well, differentiate this and find turning points or whatever you want to do. Um, this is not too bad though, as a complete the square exercise. Um, and that shows you that the minimum happens when a squared is one half, which is the equation we had before. Um, uh, 44 is 11 p.m. in their time, which is a little bit like revealing the distance from Oxford in a sort of time zone sort of sense. Um, sorry that people worldwide are watching this at weird times. Um, it is recorded, but then that's not quite so live, is it? Um, okay, right, good. Uh, so plus or minus one half, um, which is weirdly the same things that we had before. Right, uh, last part of the question. This is an, this is an example where it, it's kind of not harder or easier to just do the derivative. Um, so either way, you get down to a is plus or minus one root two. Oh, I suppose if you do the derivative, then you see that uh, all a equals zero. Um, and you need to check that actually that's a maximum. Um, I'm plugging it back in. Um, but that's one way that you might think about think about a equals zero. And you might go, ooh, what's actually going on for a equals zero? Just plugging it back in is a little bit weird. Um, zero turns out to be a lo local maximum. The distance between q and p is 
uh, an equation, a uh, sort of graph of this thing looks like uh, this, um, where it's low at two points and it's high in the in the middle. Um, as that point comes right down to the bottom, as the point Q comes right down to the bottom of the parabola, it's actually getting a little bit further away from P as it does that. Um, and then on the way back up again, it gets a bit close to P again, and then very far away as you go up the uh, parabola again. Think about graphs. Yeah, okay. Ah. And the thing that is going on in this question is about that being the same thing as right angle, the right angle thing from before. And uh, the maxima and the minima are the same thing as right angles. That's not really something that you need to understand or notice to do the question, so not that important. Um, is it symmetrical? Yes. Um, are you asking about my picture or the actual graph? The, the, the actual thing is supposed to be symmetrical. Um, you can tell because uh, if you test by plugging in minus a instead of a, you get exactly the same thing. Um, so this should have the same values at minus 3 as it does at 3, for example. Okay, it's an even function. Thank you, BR. Uh, this, paper, this question is from 2009, question 4. Uh, good, okay. Perpendicular distance. Um, right, okay, last part then is to think of an example of a point R such that RQ is smallest for a single value of A, not this pair of values of A, um, which is weird because the graph's symmetric, right? Um, so you kind of expect it to be you know, minimized somewhere on the left and somewhere on the right. Uh, you'd expect you know, there'd be somewhere on the left where the distance to R is minimized and also somewhere on the right where the distance to R is minimized. Um, unless it somehow, I don't know, uh, something broke symmetry or, or did something like that. Um, so suggestions in chat, please. This is a, an example of a question with lots of possible answers. Um, part of the fun of marking math is seeing lots of different answers to questions like this bit at the bottom. Uh, they want you to briefly justify as well. Um, so... We're looking for a point R such that um, the nearest point that you can find on the parabola it is unique. There's only only one. Um, we saw that's not the case for P um, because Q could be on the right or it could be on the left at some particular point that we found. We've calculated this twice now. Um, square root 1 over 2, one over two uh, comma 1 over 2 or the mirror image of that point. Um, suggestions uh, and Andrew's asked a question in chat can we tell the degree of a polynomial from its graph um uh, not really if the axes aren't labeled then you can't tell how big the values are which makes it hard um uh, you can tell whether the degree is odd or even by the behavior for very large values of x um yeah I guess sort of depends if you've been showing the whole graph or not um uh, right, so if you take a point not on the positive y-axis, um, then it depends. The question is actually quite quite difficult to give a precise answer to. Um, I go with let's picking something. Um, let's rephrase the question again. Let's ask it differently. Um, so the question literally says, find a point R in the plane, but not on C, such that the distance RQ is smallest for a unique value of A. Um, there's only one point, uh, one value of A, so only one place to put Q that minimizes the distance RQ. Um, not the case with P because, once again, we've seen you could put FQ on the right or symmetrically on the left. Except, um, in chat, people are saying, don't put it don't put it on the y-axis. If it's not symmetric, um, then maybe this doesn't work. Maybe there's a unique point that's, that's closest. Um, and you're onto something a bit, I think. It's it's quite hard to prove. And in fact, it's not quite true that if you're off the y-axis, there's a unique minimum. Um, if I move P a tiny bit, then it doesn't really change the algebra very much. It makes the algebra impossible to do by hand. Um, but trust me, if you move P a little bit, the nearest point on the left and the right... Um, actually, this is this true? Crisis. Ah, maybe that is true. Oh, that sounds true now. No, um, not totally on it, I think. Am I on it? Oh, not sure. <laughs> Convince me. 
<laughs> I haven't read the answer in a while. Um, full generality is a bit tough. Um, somebody else in chat has said, put somewhere, put the point below the curve, which is a very good idea. Um, if the point R is below the curve, rather than above the curve, like in the picture, if the point R is below the curve, then there's kind of a unique point. Uh, let's draw some pictures to convince ourselves ourselves of that. Pop and slip, unfortunate. There we go, there's the problem. Um, so if I put my problem here and I put the point R here, then as I move Q around, the kind of unique value of A that gives the minimum for the distance is where it's kind of closest. Um, one way to imagine this is to imagine um, drawing a little circle around R and making that circle bigger and bigger until it meets the curve. Um, it meets the curve at the um, point there, which is the, sm the smallest. Um, I'm beginning to think it is anything off the positive y-axis. I'm beginning to be convinced. Um, OK. So the line L here is the line that's joining R to Q, um, which is normal when, and you don't need to realize this for the question, but that line from R to Q is normal at, at, the, at that particular value of A. Um, there are other solutions. You stand a chance of guessing, I think. Um, if you put the point down here somewhere, ludicrously close to the curve then you get a unique you get a unique point that's closest and the origin is the closest if you put it really nearby um, so that's an example of a point on the positive y-axis that has a unique nearest point on the curve um, the reason is uh, I'm not going to go through the algebra now even though it's the algebra live stream um, is that if you copy this out but changing the one to some variable. I'm going to move it on the y-axis, uh, choose a different place to put p, um, not at 0, 1, like up at the top. Um, if you follow that through the algebra, then not very much changes, except you can change what the shape of this curve looks like. Um, so you end up with a cortex that maybe, and it's not impossible to imagine this, if I change the numbers and redo the algebra, you end up with something where the derivative maybe looks like plus something a, um, which is then um, 0 at a equals 0 and has no other turning points um, because there's no other solutions. I'm not telling you what this number is, it's complicated. Um, okay. Um, good. Okay. Um, so actually I think it's true that almost anywhere you put r is good, um, as long as you can explain it. Um, Putting the point outside the curve or underneath the curve, outside's fake, underneath the curve is, is probably the um, easiest one to explain, um, unless you like doing algebra, in which case uh, the algebra for this, just put it somewhere else on the y-axis, chosen carefully, um, below, below one half, I think is the point where it starts to, where it changes nature from having a, a minimums that are not at the origin to having a minimum that's at the origin. Um, quartic equations like this are quite fun to play with. Um, uh, if you get Desmos or something, uh, which is this website that lets you sketch things, and you put in x to the 4 plus ax squared plus b, and when you change a and b with sliders or something, you can explore how a and b affect um, what that curve looks like. Polynomials! I should not have said outside. That was yeah, The curve doesn't really have an inside. Anyway, it's not a closed curve. What would I write for my answer? Uh, to be honest, I love algebra, so I would redo the algebra um, with like a p variable in here um, and just sort of try and follow it through. Um, this is probably a mistake. Like it's probably easier to write something briefly justify your answer that's kind of convincing um, in uh, with less writing. Uh, but this is you asked how I would do it, and I would write it, write this out. I think. So then complete the square and or differentiate. So this turns out to be uh, in general plus two two p minus one and p squared d has differentiated away because um, we're differentiating with respect to a um, and then that's uh, positive. So if p is if p is Mr minus sign, I think uh, yeah one minus two p. Love algebra, just not very good at it. Um, if p is uh, less than 
one half, then this becomes negative. Then this becomes oh, sorry, this becomes a positive number. Um, so there's no other roots, so it's got a unique point at zero. Goodness me. Right. Uh, would it work if you choose oh, so you get an A cubed term? Uh, inside here. Uh, gosh. It depends. Your question boils down to whether that <laughs> so putting an x cubed term in here, and you should try this in Desmos as well because it's fun, um, makes the curve go all sort of melty on one side, and which I think then does have a unique minimum. Um, I'm feeling a bit cagey because talking about these curves is quite hard. Um, you can make this question arbitrarily difficult by putting it somewhere else. Uh, Miles wants to know about projective spaces. Uh, yeah, you can you can study those at university. For us, it's an optional optional thing. You can but don't have to. Uh, and Andrew is picking up on my <laughs> terrible phrase of the day. Uh, okay, that's the question. Um, if you wanted to see hints for that question, if you thought, gosh, that was a lot of algebra very quickly, um, then the worksheet uh, that we put on the website uh, comes with uh, basically a whole page of ideas about how to do the question. A uh, person in, in chat earlier who asked about um, have, knowing about A-level maths, but having ideas about um, how to do the question. Um, in the notes online, we've tried to explain how you might have these ideas or what, what steps you might do along the way. Um, it's not always idea-based. Sometimes it's just, hey, you should try this. Um, and if you found this too easy, um, then the bit at the bottom, which we've mentioned, there's usually an extension part in the worksheets, um, which is where you know I, I can't resist asking you something a bit harder than the math question while I've got you here. Uh, which is what's going on, which we mentioned a little bit along the way. Um, uh, right, so 404 in chat wants one more explanation of the question. Um, and it, I think it comes down to whether you understand uh, A to be a variable or A to be fixed. Um, because the question keeps asking me about the value of A, I understand A to be a variable, so rather than being a fixed point Q, um, I understand um, that to be a kind of movable point, or I'm going to choose the point A. Let's look at the very precise wording in that last part of the question to see if that's um, explained a little bit more clearly over there. Um, find A point R in the XY plane, but not on C, um, such that RQ is smallest for a unique value of A. Yeah, that's a little bit nested, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah, I suppose I'm, I'm supposed to imagine A as the variable in there, rather than um, R varying around. Yeah, okay, I might think a little bit more about that afterwards. There's something in there about how you write questions. Um, yeah, okay. What about A? What if A equals zero? Ugh, okay. Good, right. <laughs> Okay, we've got another question. I modified this one very slightly. That's a thing you can do when you have access to the source files. Um, this one works like this. I've also completely shuffled all my notes. Um, what's that? James has got notes, which doesn't seem likely. Um, this question is about a cubic um, and a line. Uh, I'll show you this on screen. Uh, briefly and then I think we should get stuck into the algebra. We've got 20 minutes of live stream to try and do this math question. Um, that's quite fast. <laughs> the cubic is x cubed minus x uh, and there's a line. Um, it meets the x-axis at a comma zero, which I can already see because when I plug in a into that line it goes through zero. Um, and it touches the cubic at b, intersects again at c, there are x coordinates b and c, brilliant, okay. a is somewhere on the left, um, B is somewhere to the right of A, but left of the origin. Um, okay, <laughs> lots of windows for where these things are. Um, okay, uh, and the actual algebra we're asked to do, there's loads of reading up here and a diagram to look at, but then the actual algebra we're asked to do um, is quite helpful. It tells us, use the fact that the line and the cubic touch. Uh, so I'm going to try and do that now. How was it modified? Uh, I put some ranges in. Uh, the original version of all of these questions, if you ever want to know how it's been modified, the original version is on the Matt's website. Um, usually the modification involves uh, radians, either 
changing how the question is written. Uh, in this case, the question, I've modified it to put some more, more explicit inequalities in. Because I don't think that it's actually confusing without the inequalities, but just precisely I think they need to be there. Um, that's not a good use of my 20 minutes. I need to not get distracted. Sorry, not your fault. It's me. Um, right, okay. Um, so two lines touch when they have the same... Uh, two lines touch if they have the same value and the same derivative. Um, um, my lines are y equals x cubed minus x and m times x minus a. Um, so I okay, get the line x cubed minus x and y equals m x minus a. And we are at the point x equals b. Um, so uh, I should have b cubed minus b is equal to m b minus a. And I should have the derivative of this thing is 3b squared minus 1 is equal to m, the derivative of that line. Ah, great. OK. So this one is the thing I was asked to do in part 1, uh, the gradients match up. Great news. Um, what's this? Um, this is another fact that's also true. Um, my philosophy in life for a lot of these is to write down true facts um, and then try and work out what they mean or what their relation is to the things in the question. I know it can feel scary to just write down a fact and see if it matches up with what you're being asked to do. Um, but there's kind of no other way, right? Um, otherwise, you're locked in this kind of guessing game where m equals 3b squared minus 1. Where did that come from? What were they thinking about when they wrote down that? Where did they have that idea? Maybe you get there by thinking about m representing the gradient. It is the gradient. And 3b squared minus 1. Ah, I calculate the gradient. They match up. Maybe you have that kind of interpretation of what the things mean. Um, and some, some people can do that. And, and sometimes I can do that. Uh, maybe you can too. You look at the question and you understand what it means. Um, and then you read a equals 2b cubed over 3b squared minus 1. You think, I have no idea what that means. Right? The, the x-intercept is somehow, in a complicated way, related to the value of b where the line touches the curve because of the cubic, maybe? There's a b cubed. Is it kind of a cubic? Um, and there's no real sort of interpretation in words of what these things on the left and right, like why they're related like this. Um, and that's where algebra comes in, um, because just writing down true facts, you need a starting point. Um, turning the things that you know into algebra lets you actually go and do the rest of the stuff. Uh, I make a big deal about this because the algebra itself is not that hard. Um, the algebra is just, I guess, divide by m. We know what m is. It's 3b squared minus 1. Um, uh, that's b minus a. I actually wanted a, so I should rearrange this to do a on the left and that stuff on the right. Um, and then I guess that simplifies to the thing on the board. Yeah, because if I put that b term over 3b squared minus 1, it's, it's 3b cubed minus b over, over that thing at the bottom. So then the b's cancel, and there's just 2b cubed left over on the top. So it's the thing at the top. Okay, yeah, use the software m, rearrange, yeah. So maybe you spot. Ah, good, br in chat, brilliant. Um, uh, used to sub for m, a rearrange, yeah. So maybe you spotted that 3b squared minus 1, came back, it was there before. It's nice when you spot a kind of familiar friend. I mean, we only just met 3b three, three squared minus 1. Maybe it's too soon to call it a friend, but spot a familiar face um, from 3b squared minus 1. There it is again. That's just nice. And they are related. They're both M. Um, ah, can you identify the degree by counting the turning points? No. Um, the number of turning points is not always M, N minus 1. Uh, uh, that's a bound. Um, but sometimes, play with the cortex. Uh, it's fun. Um, sometimes cortex has got three turning points, and sometimes they've only got one. Sometimes they've got kind of two. Um, that's not really true. It's sort of true, but really misleading. Uh, counting, there's a, there's a maximum. If your degree is six, then you can have at most five turning points, but you might only have three or one. Um, OK, uh, algebra, what are we doing? Ah, yes, OK. We're asked about the value of this thing. Um, if A is minus a million, what's the approximate value of B? And if you've got no restrictions on uh, A and B, there are kind of three possible values um, because that line can be tangent to the cubic in three different ways. Um, if you're a geometry-minded sort of person where you like visualizing shapes and, and things, um, you could imagine, hold the point A fixed and imagine moving the point B, run it along the cubic. Um, 
doesn't make any sense. Uh, where where is that line tangent to the cubic? So sometimes it crosses the cubic at the point B. If I move the point B left a little bit, then it's, I've got a line that's crossing the cubic as it as it passes really close past A. And then if I run that point off down there, I think there's a point over there where it just comes up tangent. Maybe I'm imagining changing the line so that it's tangent to the cubic. There's also a point somewhere on the right of the picture where that line through A can be tangent to B. Um, we've got some restrictions in the question um, to tell us that B is actually between A and 0, which bounds it down. Uh, people in chat say try x to the 4 in Desmos. It's only got one turning point. Uh, yeah, that's maybe the simplest example as well, just x to the 4. Good stuff, right. Um, okay, so geometry-minded people will be thinking about where to put these things. Algebra-minded people will be looking at this expression, 2b cubed over 3b squared minus 1, and trying to think out when is that big and negative. Very negative. Um, and my first guess is that Oh, if I make b really large, then who cares about minus 1? Um, b is huge, so this will be like 2b over 3. Um, so I can make that huge and very negative if I make b very negative. Um, but unfortunately, uh, that makes b uh, 3 over 2 times a, which is even more negative than a. Um, so it's not quite what we want. Um, so, gosh, so when is that very negative? It's a very big number and very negative. It might help to think about the graph or to think about when there are problems with the graph. Think about the, um, being very negative it might mean you're very close to minus infinity or something. Um, when are there problems with the graph? If you try to get it to almost divide by zero, that's a good way of putting it. Um, oh, why, why very negative? Um, I'm, I'm imagining for part three, um, that this thing is equal to negative 1 million. Um, that's, the, that's the thing there, a equals minus 10 to the 6. Um, so I tried to get it to almost divide by 0. Um, so if I make b about the square root of 3, um, then, aha, if I make it about the square root of 3, then I'll be dividing by almost 0. And if I make it, actually, I suppose it's negative, so b is negative. So I've, got, I've got to make it almost negative root 3. The question's weird. Um, so, and then if I make it just a little bit to the left of minus 3, 3 maybe it's helpful to think about the graph again at this point uh, because it's close to the turning point of f. So this is a nice link between, I think, the algebra and the geometry-minded people. Um, a has disappeared way off to the left. Um, and if you imagine doing that, to pull out A all the way out to the left, you can maybe imagine B climbing that hill on the way out. As A gets further left, the line gets flatter, so B has to get a little bit higher on that hill where the curve is flatter. A gets further out again, and B has to adjust. The line gets flatter again, and B is going to get even closer to that turning point. Where's the turning point? It's at negative root 3. Uh, oh, gosh, yeah, 1 over root 3. Sorry. Thank you, chat. Anonymous person winning again. I love algebra. I'm just not very good at it. Um, 1 over root 3. Every time I've said root 3, I mean 1 over root 3. What do they put in the answers? I bet I put root 3. Oops. Sometimes uh, the uh, solutions document comes with a sort of correction. Yep, I've put root 3. Hooray! <laughs> correction coming at some point. 1 over root 3. Ah, next time maybe. Um, okay. Um, okay. So we want that point B to be just at the top of that hill, turning point at minus one over root three. Okay. A um, little bit unsatisfying to do that with the picture, though. I would prefer to do it with the algebra, I think, even though I didn't quite get the right results at the end there. Um, okay. Uh, the question then devolves into some sort of just algebra stuff, um, where down here um, we're told that these polynomials are equal, that we can write, uh, that's the difference between the cubic and the line on the left, you don't need to notice that, um, the difference between the cubic and the line on the left and on the right, it's a cubic that has a repeated root at b and another root at c, which which makes sense I think, um, it's got to have roots at b and c because that's where, they, where the lines meet, uh, it's a repeated root at b and the curves touch there. 
Maybe that's not surprising. Um, okay, which you need not to prove, show that c equals minus 2b. Uh, the hint here is to deep breath, multiply everything out, see what happens. Um, the left is already multiplied out. It, almost. Let's keep multiplying it out. Uh, on the left and on the right, um, right, let's see if I can do this multiplying out. Uh, I think I'll do it in two steps. x squared minus 2bx plus b squared. x minus c. So the really sobering thing, I suppose, the really sort of sad thing for me is that the live stream has been going for about four years now, and I've definitely got worse at maths <laughs> for the four years. Maybe it's I'm sending out the maths to everyone else, and you can get better at maths, but I've been getting worse at maths over four years. So that's not a great fact about the live stream, I suppose. But I definitely used to be able to do this faster, more accurately. I don't know. Take your pick. Um, Okay, observation. Uh, there is some hideous mess over here. Um, the x term is really interesting to me. It's got this kind of b squared plus 2bc stuff going on. It's got this b squared c going on in here as well. Um, there's a lot going on. Um, the x squared term is where I want to point, though, because it's sort of simpler. Um, whether or not I've noticed that these things turn up in the next bit of the question, um, I should probably notice that there's no x squared on the left, and there is an x squared on the right. These things just don't look equal, and they don't look equal for lots of reasons, but one of them is the x squared coefficient. Um, I tried to label a bit of the polynomial that isn't there, so that was not my finest moment, but hey, um, c is minus 2b, so that this is 0. Um, uh, someone says thanks for radiating maths. I think I've told you that I radiated it over the last four years. <laughs> it's gone. Uh, no, too late. No, never too late. Uh, and somebody else has reminded me that mathematicians are in their best when they're 20 to 30, uh, which is hopefully not true. Uh, Roger Penrose is 91 and still doing an awful lot of stuff. Um, right, okay. Um, the last part asks us about the area, which is sort of integration thing. Um, next week on the show is integration and differentiation, so there'll be lots of time for me to practice that to, to get better at integrating it. Uh, until then, um, sneak preview of that. Um, this area between two curves thing, um, there's a good way to think about this as the, the top line minus the bottom line um, to imagine the difference between those two things. Um, and that sort of just works. It's a, bit, it's a bit good, really. You can just do the difference between the top curve and the bottom curve. Um, maybe you want to imagine it as an area minus another area. Um, so let's draw a general picture. Bit of a tangent. Uh, it's quite an extreme example of fx, f of x and g of x. Um, this area, what you're supposed to do is integral of f of x minus g of x. Um, uh, to find this area in between. Now, in the picture above there, you might have some alarm bells um, that say, <laughs> oh, but hang on, the x-axis is in here, and I've been taught to be really careful about um, bits of area that are un underneath the x-axis. Um, you're right to be careful when you're thinking about areas like that. Uh, and the area under the cubic is a bit of a weird concept to talk about because there's some positive and negative bits. Um, but luckily everything works out. The x-axis for this calculation doesn't matter. It really is as simple as doing f take away g. Um, as if the x-axis was safely down here somewhere and not a problem. Um, if you like, if you're worried about the x-axis in, in that top picture, you can imagine the following. Um, you can imagine translating both graphs up by a thousand units, so up in the sky. That doesn't change the area, because you just shoved it up in the sky. Um, but now it's definitely nothing to do with the x-axis. It's not relevant anymore. Um, it's really the area under f and the area under g. Um, and the difference between those two areas, or you can just integrate f minus g. Um, 
oh yeah, good news for everyone who's not 20 to 30. Like, according to this one person in chat, you've got your best years ahead of you. Uh, and someone's done the absolutely hilarious. I've got to read this out. Um, I say, I'm not very good at maths these days. They say, don't worry, James. There's some revision questions you can do on the Matt website, which is just A+. plus. Are you getting absolutely wrecked by chat? It's brilliant. Right, good. Okay, uh, we've got to actually do that calculation um, brilliantly in this question. Um, they've told us an expression for f minus g. Can you see it? It's this polynomial here that they told us to play with. Um, uh, or I suppose actually that's lower curve minus the upper one, so I'll minus that. Um, here I want to do something like um, the integral of, I'm going to write down the thing on the right hand side. Um, Um, I want this minus sign because I don't really want the cubic they wrote down. I want top curve, the line, minus the bottom curve, f minus g, so minus sign. Uh, but I will use their expression to write that as x minus b squared, x minus c. Um, and in fact, if c is equal to minus 2b, then this is, this is not too bad at all. Uh, I should think about the limits. I guess they're from b to c, which is from b to minus 2b. Um, Integral's not that bad, just keep it multiplying it out, uh, it's a bit of a pain. There's a geometry way to think about this, where you just imagine the point B moving around. Imagine the point A moving around so that B moves, and so that the area changes. Um, to try and maximise it, try and lift it up and make the area big. Um, I find that quite hard to imagine, uh, but I'm quite comfortable to just do that integral. Not going to do it on the stream. Um, uh, yeah, R is in the diagram. Um, it is, R, is R defined in the diagram? Ooh, arguably. Uh, down it below by the cubic. They did describe it a bit in that last part. Uh, down it above by the line and below by the cubic. Ah, oh, so you can't put something weird going on on the left. Okay, suggestion in chat about something weird you could try. Um, uh, that hasn't quite passed muster. Good, right, I'm not going to do that integral. If you want to see the answer to that integral, uh, then two methods to find out what the answer to this integral is. Um, try it yourself, or check the solutions document, or secret third way, it's 27 over 4 b to the 4. Um, which I sort of know because I happen to remember that the answer down here is 27 over 4, and I remember that that happens when the point b is really far left. And it only gets really far left when the point a comes all the way up towards minus 1. Um, so B going left moves the line up and makes the area bigger. Um, it can get as far left as minus 1, which happens just when A, not minus a million, when A comes into minus 1, uh, then B is at minus 1 as well. Uh, and the answer printed is 2704, which is how I remember that it's 27 over 4 times B to the 4 or something. Uh, yeah, so it'd be doing negative 1 for this to be really good. How do I get f of x and g of x? Um, so the f and g on the left are my general picture. Um, for this particular problem, f of x is the line m x minus a and g of x is that cubic um, x cubed minus x. Um, so I didn't write that down but I should have written down m x minus a close brackets minus x cubed plus x which is kind of literally this thing in here with a minus sign but it's literally the thing on the left of that expression. Um, Ah, there's a definition of R in the question not quite at work. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't do an evil laugh there, but I've already modified this question to make it work slightly better. Um, if you're using a screen reader, um, I can't remember if I've done a description of R for... So if it's a serious question. If you're using a screen reader on the Matt website, there's a version of the question sheet, uh, an accessible version on the web, I can't remember if I described where R is. So it's a serious question about describing where R is. Cool, we're about to hit 7 o'clock, and I've also run out of mat. Um, didn't actually do the integral at the end, because I didn't really trust myself to multiply this out and integrate the polynomial, but it's good to leave some things as homework, right? Um, if you want an extension question for this, there's something in there to actually, you know, prove that these things are equal. Might be something to think about. Not part of the mat question, of course. Um, and also set you a question with a different cubic. Um, uh, the extension question is on here, underneath all these hints. Um, why can't I show you that? Oh, because it's not 
split. There we go. Uh, there's your questions on the left there. Um, if you want to try this for a different cubic, um, two ways to do this. One is to repeat the algebra. One is to be slightly cunning. Um, and I think I'll leave that with you as something to try at home. We're going to be back next week for integration and differentiation. I already told you. Um, so we'll see you in 166 hours for another episode of the Oxford Map Livestream. Take care, chat. Bye. How do I? No, I, I do know. <laughs>